Hello, everybody. Hi there. My name is Atatürk. I'm a research scientist in Boston University and the Massachusetts Open Cloud. And today we will introduce you our Big Data as a Service solution that we are building and implementing in the Massachusetts Open Cloud. And these deck of slides and this work was a collaboration between multiple entities, uh, as you see at the bottom. And we have a number of talkers and presenters that, that prepared the slides, but I will go over most of them um, to make it brief for you guys. So we are living in the, literally living in the era of big data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence. We are generating enormous amounts of data, not only human generated data, but also machine generated data. And enterprises and organizations are recognizing the value of analyzing this data uh, to improve their performance, to improve uh, their efficiency to improve uh, their services, to provide more intelligent services to their users, to get some competitive edge. And uh, cloud is a great platform for these environments because they, it provides uh, better cost, better scale, better availability, be easier management opportunities. So, and we see this pattern of moving of these big data analytics platforms to the cloud uh, and the rising of these public cloud offerings such as AWS Elastic MapReduce, Amazon Public Datasets, Azure HD Insight. There are these platforms that, that provide these services and they are getting more and more popular. And in this talk, we will try to explain to you our efforts of, of providing such a service in our own cloud in MOC. Um, and this service is running on top of OpenStack. Obviously, otherwise we wouldn't be here. Um, uh, we had to build some components on top of OpenStack to be able to provide these services. Um, we had to develop a cloud data set repository. We had to build user-friendly UIs that enables uh, setting up, that eases the setting up of uh, big data frameworks. And we had to develop a data center scale caching solution so that the, uh, you, our users can access to the data sets fast and can set up these environments very fast. And I will go over these in, in this talk. Uh, briefly about MOC, uh, the MOC is a collaboration of, between the academia, industry, and government. It's a very unique organization in this sense, um, and we are trying to build a public cloud uh, on top of this open cloud exchange model, uh, which is a novel model. If you had listened to the talks in the first day on Monday, we, we covered the MOC's essentials. Uh, the partners of MOC, academic partners of MOC include the Boston University, Harvard, Northeastern, uh, MIT, and UMass. Uh, our core academic industry partners include Intel, Red Hat, Lenovo, Brocade, Two Sigma, and Cisco. Uh, from the government side, the US Air Force and the uh, Commonwealth of Massachusetts are providing our funding. Um, we are currently offering IAS services on top of OpenStack. We have a 15 megawatt data center in Western Massachusetts in Holyoke. Um, this data center is owned and operated by these five research universities. It's a shared uh, co-location facility by owned by these five group, or five group, five universities. And the, one of the core mandates of MOC is offering big data analytics, uh, machine learning, and artificial intelligence services, offering services for enabling big data analytics. Uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence, research and innovation. All right, so when we decided, decided to build this big data as a service solution, we started talking with our potential users. Um, our initial potential users are mostly coming from our MOC partners, so namely coming from the academia and the industry and, and the government. Um, and we try to decide a set of features that we need, we wanted to support in our solution. Uh, initially, we started with, with a design that is similar to Amazon Public Data Sense and AWS Elastic MapReduce, where we have a centralized data repository that hosts the data sets. And we have a computational platform that supports on-demand big data cluster setup. This was our initial starting point. But as we, kept, as we kept talking with our users, potential users, we realized that we had to have more features. Uh, than that. So one of the one of the requirements that our users wanted from us was 
being able to easily search data sets, so the AWS public data sets just list the set of uh, data sets. We wanted to be able to have advanced searching facilities. We want to have mechanisms to incentivize sharing and collaboration on these data sets. So uh, um, especially researchers wanted to be able to get citations for the data sets that they upload. Uh, we wanted to be able to su have support for not only public data sets, but also community-owned data sets. Uh, there are certain researchers and, and state organizations that want to upload their data sets, uh, but um, they don't want to share it with everybody. For example, researchers in CERN, uh, they want to share it with other phys physicists, but only the physicists that collaborate within the CERN project. So we wanted to be able to have support for community data sets. Uh, our final, oh no, uh, we, we had an, after investigating the usage patterns of these data sets, we realized that some of these data sets are, um, have a weird usage pattern. Practically, most of the data sets that we are trying to host are periodically updated, like weather data sets or traffic data sets that are coming from the state or um, social network data sets. They are collected every day or every hour or every week. And uh, the usage patterns of these data sets by the analysts are weird. The, late, the more recent the data set, the more the usage is. So if we use default storage mechanisms, we would observe lots of load imbalances and uh, network imbalances. So we realized that we had to provide some caching feature within our data center. So we started building a caching mechanism for our data center. Finally, uh, since MOC is collocated and placed in a shared data center, um, we had this requirement that was imposed by our own infrastructure. We had to have mechanisms for uh, pooling and sharing the, the hardware resources available provided by the multiple entities that are composing the MOC. Uh, uh, so we had this additional requirement that was imposed on us by, by the MOC's infrastructure. So I, I will try to visualize this set of requirements on, 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 a, on, a, on, a, on an image so you can understand it better. So we started with OpenStack as our computational platform and Ceph as our centralized data set uh, data lake. Um, for on-demand uh, big data cluster setup, we quickly settled on Sahara because um, uh, Sahara provides necessary functionality that we need, even though the UIs of Sahara are not as, uh, as good as we, will, we would like. So we had to do some changes in there, but still we, we like the functionality provided by the Sahara. So this is what we had and what we started with. So on top of this, we had to build this data set repository solution for incentivizing data set sharing, for uh, making uh, searching of data sets easier, for providing support for not only public data sets, but also for community data sets as well. And also we had to build this data set caching solution so we could uh, provide access to uh, commonly used data sets uh, faster so that uh, on-demand clusters are, can be set up faster. And also we had to build this uh, repurposing scaling based on demand solution due to the requirements of MOC. So I will first start with the data set repository solution. Actually, previous talk was discussing about how this was implemented, but uh, I will quickly go over it. Um, Cloud Dataverse, first we investigated the data set, any, if there was any data set repository solution provided in OpenStack, and we couldn't find any that catered to the needs, specific needs we have, such as sharing, uh, uh, sharing incentives, support for community data sets. Uh, generally used solution of providing just public Swift or S3 endpoints did not work for us. So we needed this data set repository solution for the cloud. So we, uh, after looking at available open source solutions, we settled on Dataverse, um, which is an open, open source data set repository project and decided to expand it, extend it so that it, works, it can work with OpenStack, which resulted with the Cloud Dataverse project. So briefly, what is Dataverse? Dataverse is an open source software platform for building data repositories. It provides incentives for sharing data sets, uh, such as providing document object identifiers for each data set. So you can get credit when you upload a data set. Uh, you can get credit for the data set uh, by getting citations in the form of citations. Um, 
Dataverse also provides mechanisms for controlling who accesses which data set. So when you upload a data set, you can determine which users can access your data set. So it inherently has community data set support. It also has a long lasting community. It has been, uh, the Dataverse project started 10 years ago within Harvard, but now it's being deployed uh, over more than 20 uh, sites all around the world. And there are more than 500 institutions using it. Um, so, especially in the academic community, uh, Dataverse has uh, achieved widespread acceptance. So, if you have a paper in nature or science, there the chances that the data set that you use is in one of these Dataverse sites is very high. So, uh, it's a it's a it has a community. It has a long lasting. It is a long lasting project. That's also what we liked about Dataverse. So, within the Cloud Dataverse project, in collaboration with the uh, Harvard Dataverse team. Uh, we decided to create a new uh, software for, for the cloud, Dataverse repository software for the cloud. Um, Dataverse was initially designed for smaller data sets, and it was using network file system uh, for storage, and, 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 and we switched the storage backend to Ceph to have, more scalable, uh, to have a more scalable repository with support for much larger data sets. Um, Dataverse also did not have a replication mechanism, and we are now currently building this harvesting solution for replicating data sets in the cloud. Uh, of course, we also added this compute, compute button next to each, each data set. So now you don't need to download data sets to be able to compute over them. You can just click on this compute button and within, since the Dataverse uh, storage and Dataverse compute services, the, the compute services that you provide are within the same data center, you don't need to do any transformation of data over the network. You can quickly start your analysis on the data. Um, so, we settled on Cloud Dataverse as our dataset repository. We are still building the Cloud Dataverse. Uh, it is still an ongoing project. Uh, next, I will go talk, uh, we actually will talk about our dataset caching uh, solution for fast on demand access. Oh, hello, everyone. Um, so, now I'm going to talk about our uh, caching solution that we developed. Actually, this was started as a research project. So, um, so we designed a caching mechanism, which is a SSD based base, uh, and block level caching mechanism. It's designed to speed up. Okay, it's designed to speed up the uh, big data accesses to the data lake. And um, so, uh, when we designed it, we actually like inspired by the today's uh, content delivery network. So, or CDNs. So, CDNs are basically like the caching the data on the um, access side of the network, and they use uh, DNS to forward uh, or to connect the client to the uh, closest cache node. So, we adopt a similar approach here. Um, so, our like D3N solution is basically cache uh, frequently used uh, data sets. Uh, to, prevent the uh, to prevent the bottlenecks uh, occur on the network. Um, because um, today, like, not all the data uh, center has, like, a bisection, uh, full bisection bandwidth, and uh, we have a lot of oversubscription happens because of we see different bottlenecks on the differ different level of the network hierarchy. And um, we also use, like, a DNS, like, a lookup servers. We basically distribute those servers across our data center. And uh, these DNS-like lookup servers are uh, used to forward our requests to the closest or least loaded uh, caches. And uh, this way, our VMs uh, don't have to know or aware of the uh, data center network topology or the state of the caches. Also, um, uh, as I said, uh, we are using like a block level uh, granularity to cache the data to benefit various applications. You can think about Spark, Hive, Peak. Okay, now in this picture, you see a typical data center architecture, right? We have the racks at the bottom, which contains our compute nodes running big data applications. And on the top, you see a hierarchical network topology. And um, since we, like, when we move up to this hierarchy, we see usually more oversubscription and congested links. Uh, so what we have done is, um, so D3N is at the following components in this uh, architecture. Uh, first, we add these AnyCast lookup servers on each rack. 
And as I said before, these uh, servers are basically direct uh, the request from VMs to the closest cache nodes. The second component we add is the cache servers or cache node, I, as I said. So these servers we installed on um, each rack and these servers are equipped with high speed uh, SSDs basically. And then we implement a multiple level of cache on top of these cache servers. Now I'm gonna talk about um, different level of uh, the, each of these individual level of caches. So first we, um, first, uh, we have the L1 caches. These are uh, uh, implemented per uh, cache servers and the goal of the L1 cache is basically reduce the accesses to the top of rack switches. And then uh, we have L2 cache pools. These are like, you can think about like a distributed cache implemented within the cluster. And the goal of this is like the reduced to accesses or um, traffic generated to the cluster switches. And of course, when you move up to hierarchy, you can add more layer of caches, but what's happening today is usually you don't need a cache, cache for each level. Usually like two or three level cache probably will eliminate most of the bottlenecks that you see in your data center. And um, since all of these like layers are implemented within the same cache servers, uh, we can flexibly, we are, we are very flexible to change their size based on the needs. And um, so this was our design and we implemented in, a, in the Massachusetts Open Cloud. So when we implement it, we only uh, implement the second level cache and the first level cache because that's what, our, uh, that's what we need in our architecture. And I'm just gonna briefly explain what we have done. So we implemented our um, caching solution within the Rados Gateway and we only uh, implement, add, modify like 2,500 of lines. And um, so when we, uh, when we forward the request from one level cache to second level cache, for example, you have a miss on the first level cache, then you have to forward your request to the second level cache. We are using consistent hash algorithm uh, to compute the location uh, for each block. And um, as I mentioned, Previously, like iteratively, our solution forwards the request from clients to the cache. And now I'm gonna show you some very excited results. So uh, we run a simple curl benchmark to see the performance our, of our cache implementation. And in the x-axis, you, x-axis you see uh, we scale the number of concurrent nodes who are making the request. And at the y-axis you see the aggregated throughput. And um, so the light purple bar, which is the uh, RGW, is the unmodified original Rados gateway code. So we base, in this scenario, our virtual machines basically read the data from the data lake. And the dark purple um, bar represents the D3 and L1 hit uh, performance. In here, our virtual machines read the data from a uh, rack local L1 um, cache. So, and as you see, uh, D3N can provide up to five time performance improvements comparing to vanilla Rados gateway, and we can saturate the read speed of SSD. Uh, so the, uh, currently we are upstreaming D3N as an experimental feature to the Ceph, and uh, we are deploying this uh, caching architecture in the uh, mass open clouds. And uh, we are right now evaluating like the D3N under the uh, variety of workloads. So please talk to us if you have any example data sets that we can test. Right, uh, I will talk briefly about the existing hardware infrastructure we have in MOC uh, for serving this big data as a service solution. Um, we are sharing the compute resources of, of the Engage One HPC cluster. So this is a production HPC cluster deployed in the shared data center that, that I mentioned, the MGHPCC, uh, which hosts around 300 servers distributed across 18 racks. Uh, we extended this cluster by adding 10 gig, 10 gig NICs to each server, adding a top of rack switch to each rack, and adding a cache server, as, as over mentioned, to each rack with three terabyte Intel SSDs and 40 gig uplinks. Uh, uh, we connected these top of rack switches in a bifurcated ring topology. I, our, our 
uh, when the bisectional bandwidth of our network is around one terabits per second, and between any two racks, we have um, three distinct paths. Um, uh, our storage solution is based on Ceph, as I mentioned. Uh, current deployment, current storage, current data lake solution is running on top of 19, 19 spin, 90 spindles. Uh, 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 assigned as 90 OSDs, and our current storage capacity is uh, around 326 terabytes. And this is served by 10, 10 servers distributed within the, uh, within the network. Uh, so uh, uh, D3N, is, oh, D3N is our dataset caching solution, so this slide is misplaced. Um, so this is a brief picture of how our uh, physical hardware architecture looks like. As I mentioned, our storage backend is Ceph, we have a 300 26 terabyte uh, capacity as of now, but we are trying to expand to 20 petabytes. Uh, we have one more additional server, uh, additional rack, uh, in addition to the HPC cluster that serves our static OpenStack deployment. Um, and there we are running OpenStack and we are running the Cloud Dataverse repository and the, we are using Sahara to, to spin up on-demand clusters. And as the demand on this OpenStack deployment increases, we expand and borrow resources, borrow hardware, borrow servers from the, from the production grade running HPC cluster. So I will explain how we do it briefly. <coughs> um, so I will explain how we do this repurposing scaling operation. Um, so as I mentioned, we are running all of MOCs running on top of MGHPCC, the shared data center. Uh, this data center is owned by these five research universities, and the amount of resources available, hardware resources available to MOC are actually meager. Like we, ha we are running on top of a few hundred servers normally, uh, but as the demand increases, we have agreements with all of these groups. As the demand increases uh, to our cloud, we can borrow hardware resources from this system, so we can expand to these other clusters. Uh, but uh, when we don't have demand, we have to give back these resources. So for us, what is critical is to be able to borrow these resources and give them back uh, without creating any disruptions in both, of our, both our environment and uh, uh, any disruption in their environment, and also be able to do this uh, elastic uh, borrowing and giving away nodes as fast as possible so that we do not reduce the utilization of the overall data center. And uh, to achieve this, we developed two levels of um, uh, services. The first service that we developed is the hardware isolation layer. Uh, this is a, a shimming layer that we run only in the network layer that provides us uh, elastic resource allocation and network isolation services. And uh, we did this service such that it's compatible with any provisioning solution. So it just provides you uh, isolation, uh, and for provisioning, you can use any provisioning tool you have. So if you have an HPC environment, you can use your own provisioning tool. If you have an OpenStack environment, if you are different groups that are running different HPC environments and have, you would like to use different provisioning solutions, you can use our own provisioning solution. Um, uh, and still, to be able to do this provisioning very fast from one environment to the other, we also developed another provisioning solution as well, which we call the bare metal image management system or bare metal imaging system. Um, BMI does diskless provisioning and network booting from pre-installed images. Uh, and through this, by this, it can provide rapid provisioning and it can provide the benefits of image management that is available to virtual machine systems to bare metal systems. So that's very beneficial to us. We can take an environment and give it back, uh, uh, in, uh, use it and give it back in the state that we had taken away. So. Uh, this is very beneficial to, to our collaborators as well. And also, it, 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 incre it reduces the amount of reprovisioning significantly. So a standard provisioning tool such as Foreman requires around 25 minutes for provisioning an environment. And with BMI, we can provision an environment under six minutes. Um, so our repurposing scaling solution is based on a combination of Hill and BMI. So, uh, to build uh, this, 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 this big data as a service solution, we had to develop num a number of components and had to make a number of changes into OpenStack. So I will quickly go over the set of requirements we had and the changes we made and the takeaways we kind of want to give to the OpenStack community. Um, we had to build a dataset repository solution. We settled on the Cloud Dataverse. Um, our takeaway is current Cloud Dataverse is running as an application on top of OpenStack. And it would be great if OpenStack internalizes, 
internalized cloud dataverse, uh, because OpenStack needs a data set repository solution. We could not be the only team that needs a data set repository solution, such as, uh, such as the one the, the, that needs the features that, uh, that Cloud Dataverse can offer. Um, we developed uh, a data, data center scale caching solution, D3N, and we are working in, uh, in uh, upstreaming this into Ceph, uh, so this should be available to researchers, but, but for our takeaway for the OpenStack community is if OpenStack could integrate with the caching solutions, uh, it could offer more intelligent uh, decision, uh, decision capabilities to, it, to its users. For example, you, uh, you could use, if OpenStack is aware of the data placement within the cache, you can decide on uh, VM placement or you can decide on data routing. Uh, you can make intelligent data routing decisions. Um, Finally, we had to develop a number of user-friendly UIs. The previous talk was talking about it. On Monday, we talked uh, about the GG project as well. Uh, unfortunately, the current UI for Sahara is, is very complex, especially in the cluster setup initiation phase. Um, and most of our users, um, uh, early users, I would say, are complaining about it. Uh, we definitely needed a few Fib click cleaner UIs, and we had to develop them sell, our, our, those themselves our, ourselves. So uh, our, our takeaway is if, if either Sahara UI team could talk with our team to, to internalize those solutions, or uh, if you could come uh, to a general uh, consensus in how to do this in a few clicks, few clicks, it would be useful. All right, to sum up, um, our big data as a, we, we developed a big data as a service solution at MOC. We are providing uh, a data set repository to host very large data sets. We are providing mechanisms to collaborate on these data sets. And we are providing a computational platform to, to analyze these data sets. Um, um, and we are providing caching mechanisms so you don't need to actually hug your big data clusters. You can give them away and come back to them and you will still be able to access your data very fast. Um, uh, all of the Big Data as a Service project was built as a collaboration between multiple entities, multiple groups with, that, that are partnering within the MOC. Uh, our networking solution came from, uh, initially came from Brocade and we invented on it a lot. Our storage and caching solution initially came for, from Lenovo and, and, and Intel. Uh, and the design for the CDN like caching mechanism initially came from Intel, even though the implementation was done in the academy in Boston University in the Northeastern, and the deployment was done by MOC engineers. Um, the whole effort was a collaboration between multiple entities, and we believe that this is, this is a good example of how the open cloud model that, that MOC stands for uh, can benefit uh, research and innovation in the cloud space. Um, because both industry, uh, uh, academia, and the government collaborated within this project to provide this end-to-end -end solution. All right, thank you. If you have questions, we can take them now. Yeah, sure. So I noticed that you talked a little bit about your high performance computing and I noticed that you have a lot of cluster networks. Are you guys using dark fiber or internet to like HPC networks? And if you are, is that beneficial to the solution you have? If not, are you using standard circuits that you get for like point of presence circuits that you get from your current carriers? Right, as of now we are within the data center even though the HPC system has its the HPC system has its own network. We are not using the HPC system's network. We are we are we developed our own network within within the cluster, not to be not to disturb their communications. Any more questions? Yeah. What uh, what 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 kind of caching algorithm do you use? Um, uh, you know, LRU, level, yeah. et cetera, and yeah, we, we have can I program it? So can, right can now, I, can right I now it? Uh, we are using LRU, but uh, we, like in the future, we, we have some ideas about like segmented LRU, and we didn't, uh, those are gonna be coming up soon, but currently it's LRU. What is the block size that you're using? 
So we are using the default, it's a configurable parameter for Rados Gateway. We are using the default block size, which is four megabyte. If you are interested in uh, both for the caching solution and, and Dataverse and the other tools, we have um, both, uh, we just recently made academic submissions, so we have more detailed technical documents that we can share, so if you are interested, just reach to us and we can share them with you. Uh, uh, and also, um, if you have data sets or if you have workloads or if you wanna try our, our, our caching solution, for example, if you're interested in trying it, um, uh, right now, we, we are only exposing this architecture to a set of trusted users, I would say. This is still in beta. It's not open to public yet, but reach out to us and we can, we can definitely expose it to you and we can try to collaborate and to improve it. All of the projects that I mentioned, the Cloud Dataverse, the, uh, the D3N even, and the, um, uh, the DG project, they are all open source projects. They have their GitHub repositories. The Hill, BMI, they are all open source projects. They have their own GitHub repositories. Um, if you look at MesOpen Cloud website, um, you can find out the links. Uh, and please reach out to us. We'd like to, we'd like to get more collaborators. All right. All right.